Uh, we're here this evening in the Asia Pacific Hall of the Morris Wask Center for Dialogue, and we're also on the web at www.sfu.ca slash Sterling Prize. So we're here to present the 2018 Sterling Prize for Controversy. So this unique award is the result of the vision and generosity of Nora and Ted Sterling, who established this in 1993, so it's been running for quite a long time, to recognize work that provokes and or contributes to the understanding of controversy. And to opening this evening's award ceremony and bid an official welcome, I'd like to invite Margaret Elder George to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Thank you. Glad you're here, awake. Welcome to the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and the shared territory at Vancouver. And welcome to this evening's um, event. Just a quick prayer, and we'll get this event going. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Just guide us in our words, our thoughts, and our actions, letting us always remember that we are the leaders and the mentors of those who follow us, those who witness what we do and what we say. I ask the community and thank the community for allowing us to do the work that we do and our families for the time that we miss with them. And Great Spirit, just a very special blessing on this evening and a very special blessing on the, on the individuals who make this evening very special for community on my relations. On yours. So my name is Ron Eidenberg. I chair the Sterling uh, Prize Committee. It's my pleasure to host uh, the event this evening and I'll outline for you briefly uh, what's going to happen. Over the next few minutes, you'll hear about the prize, and I'll introduce Dr. Peter Keller, our academic vice president, uh, who will tell you something about the university's position on this prize and why we do it. Uh, the prize and the accompanying check will then be awarded, and I'll introduce the, uh, the recipient in just a few moments. And there uh, will be a presentation following. Uh, it's going to be very interesting and fun this evening, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, and there will be some time for uh, questions and answers following the presentation. And we should wrap all of that up about 9 o'clock. And following that, there's a reception outside here in the atrium. And uh, you're, of course, all invited uh, to attend that part of the evening as well. Now, as I mentioned, the Nora and Ted Sterling uh, established the endowment that supports the prize in 1993. If you've been watching the uh, monitors prior to the start of the ceremony, it was showing you uh, previous recipients of the prize going back all that time. So this is from the terms of reference uh, that describe the prize, and this is what Nora and Ted wrote when they established the prize. The Sterling Prize may be awarded for work in any field, including but not limited to fine arts, humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and education. And if you look back over all those award winners, people uh, from all of those uh, disciplines have uh, been recipients of the prize at one time or another. To be eligible for the prize, the work must be the object of or present a meaningful analysis of the conduct or consequences of controversy. However, the work must be more than simp simply controversial. It should present new ways of looking at the world, be daring and creative, decidedly unconventional, we'll see that this evening, and distinctly untraditional. In short, the Sterling Prize celebrates work that challenges complacency but it must also re meet recognizably high standards and be morally, morally and ethically sound. There's a call for nominations each year. That will happen uh, in December or January. Those come in and the committee then meets in the course of the spring and decides by consensus uh, on the recipient of the prize. So the committee uh, that awards the prize is meant to be broadly representative of the university as a whole. Uh, it includes faculty members, staff members, uh, and students. It includes men and women and people of diverse backgrounds. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I did not thank the members of this year's Sterling Prize Committee for their uh, service, 
Most of them are here this evening. Luis Godin is professor of mathematics. He's over here. Jan McLean is senior lecturer in education. Jan sitting over there. Mary Aylesworth is our staff representative. She's in procurement services. Mary is here. Mary, Mary's over here. Hi, Mary. And Vance Williams is professor of chemistry, also sitting over here. So thank you all for your service. And I'd now like to uh, call on Dr. Peter Keller, who's the vice president, academic and provost, to say a few words. So uh, good evening, everybody, and, and thank you, Elder Margaret, and, uh, and, and, and thank you, Ron, for those uh, words of introduction and for the introduction of this, uh, this prize. So if you take two words, the word contra, which stands for against, and the word vertere, to, to turn, and you put them together, then you get the word controversy, to turn against. And uh, controversy is, is a fascinating topic, and uh, it leads to many questions one, one could ask. What, why do we have controversy? Is controversy embedded in nature? What, uh, what feeds, or what, what, what fuels, what drives controversy? Can we imagine a world without controversy? What is the difference between genuine controversy and manufactured controversy? And how do we recognize and how do we protect against manufactured controversy, especially as it is imposed on us by politicians, by the media, and, and by marketing? I think uh, those are fascinating questions, and uh, we could spend all the, this evening beginning to debate them, and uh, we would barely make a, make a start, but we're not here to debate those questions. Um, we're here for much, much better things. Um, there is, however, one question which I would like to explore a little bit further. And that is, what is the relationship between a university and controversy? And I will share that controversy has a very significant role to play in the academy. The advancement of knowledge, new insights, and also creativity thrive on controversy. It is only by challenging existing theory and by challenging existing beliefs that they can advance new theories and a new knowledge and new understanding. Controversy challenges minds. It focuses us to organize. It, it, it makes us really um, um, challenge ourselves to reason and to place our arguments in, in logic. Of course, the academy also advocates that we engage in rules when we engage in controversy. So the expectation is that controversy is handled respectfully and professionally. And the, uh, the expectation is that argumentation is objective, that it's based on evidence, and that it follows reasoning. I'll share with you that I, I, I very fondly remember my undergraduate days uh, back in Ireland uh, at Trinity, um, where we had a debating society, uh, and how that debating society really honed in us the art and the science of, of debating and, and advancing controversy. Now, Simon Fraser University is not afraid to engage in controversy and to engage in challenging and difficult conversations. And tonight is an example of, of that. Tonight, we gathered here in the Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue, a building that supports dialogue and that's all about controversial subjects. And I'd like to take this opportunity to um, to thank the Wask family for the generous gifts um, of, uh, of this building. And as Ron already shared, tonight's dialogue is made possible by the support from Nora and Ted Sterling's generous endowment of the annual Sterling Prize for Controversial Research. And I want to thank the Sterlings for that. I also want to take this moment to, to join Ron in thanking the, the committee for um, um, identifying this year's winner. And with that, um, I think I'll, I'll share with you um, it's no surprise that that winner is the lady sitting next to me on my left, Leila Cameron. So let me introduce Leila a little bit to you. Leila is recognized for her work on issues surrounding body size and image, including the institutional and systemic discrimination faced by fat people. Leila Cameron is a journalist, a filmmaker, a fat activist, 
and the Simon Fraser University PhD student in communication. Later's dissertation research analyzes the participation of fat bodies in reality television and asks whether fat positive representations are possible within that genre. She is known for her film, Fat Hiking Club, a documentary that follows Summer Michel Skog, did I pronounce that right? The founder of the Portland, Oregon organization, Fat Girls Hiking, and her mission to make the outdoors accessible for everybody and every body. The film premiered at the 30th Vancouver Queer Film Festival in August, and Leila is currently touring the film internationally and it's integrating it into her research. Now, I think let's learn more about Leila from a video. When we look at obesity as a worldwide health epidemic, which is factually incorrect because obesity is not a disease, you can't catch obesity. Um, we legitimize the stigma and oppression of fat people because we see it as something that is either a result of poor lifestyle choices or health threat. Television as a visual medium, it's an industry for the exploitation of fatness as a quote-unquote health issue. What I am advocating for and what other fat activists are advocating for is tolerance and acceptance regardless of what your body looks like. And so one of the things that I think needs to happen is integrating fat people into our communities and then elevating their voices is one way that we can show our solidarity or allyship with the fat community. Okay, there you go. Now, come on up. <laughs> All right, Ron, I think we're gonna hand over the... This is a photo op. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're going to introduce our two other guests. Okay, thank you, Peter. So I'm uh, going to introduce uh, Layla's portion of the program this evening. And like we did last year with Don McPherson, uh, Layla has elected to have two uh, respondents join her in the presentation. That was very successful last year and it was a big hit with the audience. So I'm very happy she's delighted. Uh, I'm delighted she's uh, decided to do that again this year. But I have to tell you that when uh, we worked up the script for this, I, I, I thought, I can't say this. This is really taking me outside of my comfort zone and actually publicly introducing uh, these two people in this way. But uh, when I consider, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that now, uh, but when I think back on it in our discussion in the committee room, it was exactly this kind of thing that made us decide this is exactly the right kind of thing for this prize because it really changes the way uh, you look at the world and the people in it around you. So let me read that to you and ask me to, uh, ask you to think to yourself, if you were standing up here in place of me, could you say this comfortably? So here are the two respondents. Uh, Athena Afan is on the outside there. Athena is a fat, bi, cisgender, femme settler of Afro-Caribbean descent. She is a Metro Vancouver local and has lived here an entire life. And for over a decade, she has supported women survivors of violence and trauma and facilitated several anti-oppression workshops for various communities and organizers. Uh, she's a mom, mother of two young children. I'll add that in there. And she's a student at the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology. And Logan Trudeau is sitting over here. Uh, they are a fat, gimpy queer living on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salwatooth First Nations. They enjoy making things with their hands, spending time with dear friends and community, and volunteering for various events, including Vancouver Folk Music, a music Festival and the Variety Club Telethon of Hearts. So with that, uh, let me turn the podium over to Layla. Please welcome Layla Cameron. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I was surprised at how happy it made me to hear the word fat be said again and again in this setting. I don't think I was expecting to feel that kind of joy after 
you know, years of identifying as fat and using that word, but I appreciate uh, it being used here this evening. First, I would like to sincerely thank Ron Eidenberg and the Sterling Prize Selection Committee and Peter Keller and the Office of the VP Academic for this incredible honor. I am very grateful for and humbled by this opportunity. Thank you as well to Elder Margaret for welcoming us here this evening. I would also like to thank the SFU Public Square team, including Janet Weber, Nicole Payer, Ian Bryce, Gabriel Colomb, Landon Hoyt, and Katie Wong for all of their hard work leading up to and including tonight. I greatly appreciate all of your efforts. I would like to thank my colleague, Alicia Baines, for nominating me for this award, and my supervisor, Dr. Zoe Jurek, who is here tonight, for not only her support and guidance, um, but for encouraging me to integrate fat studies into our work together, so thank you. Uh, thank you to Helen Camisa and Calamity Hildebrandt for supplying the handouts that are at your seats this evening. The zines that have been distributed, so those little booklets, uh, are from Fat Panic, which is an organization actually based out of SFU that has been working for fat liberation for over two decades. Um, it's important to me at this time to also acknowledge that I am what fat activists would call a small fat individual. So this means that while I move through the world as a fat person, I have more privilege than those, than those who are fatter than me. For example, I can usually find clothing in plus size clothing stores in my size, and I usually have an okay time finding adequate seating in public spaces. I am also a white settler on this land, and I cannot speak to the experiences of fat people whose identities intersect in other ways, such as those who are trans or who are people of color. I am very grateful to have Logan Trudeau and Athena Afan here with us tonight, whose presentations provide valuable and critical insight into the diversity of fat experiences. Thank you both very much for being here and for being willing to share your stories. Let's see if this works, perfect. I don't know if you can read the, can you read the cartoon? Is that all right? Okay. So my area of research is reality television because I just love reality TV. And anyone I say that to usually has a pretty strong opinion about it. They either really love it or they also really hate it. And I think that both opinions speak volumes about who we are as a society and how we view and treat each other. Specifically, I study how bodies are used and represented in reality TV, and I'll talk a bit more about this later, but I've quickly learned that in order to earn anyone's attention when it comes to my research, I first have to assume the role of a public health professional and discuss the medicalization of fatness. And this has been an interesting experience because medicine is not necessarily a closely related field to that of media studies, but I'm going to do my best. I've had to become uh, familiar with public health research so that I'm prepared for the inevitable questions or backlash that most fat study scholars and fat activists face. Now, I don't feel bad about assuming the role of a medical expert because the vast majority of our society often also assume the role of a medical doctor. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, I appreciate it. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> Every day, many people think that they can diagnose someone with a disease or a disorder or assume someone's health status just from looking at them. Fatness in particular, as a visible stigma, often signifies more than just how much space someone takes up. In our culture, fatness is believed to reveal someone's dietary preferences, lifestyle choices, fitness capabilities, level of pride or dignity in themselves, family background, and medical history. When we think about it, of course it is ridiculous to assume that we can know any of those things about a person just by looking at them. But considering the intensity with which fatness has been constructed as a worldwide health epidemic and how ingrained our fear of fat is in the name of health, I think it is important to first start off with a discussion about our assumptions on fatness and health and the myths that guide medical research on fat bodies. So why do we hate fat people so much? Well, fatness has not always been pathologized as a medical condition. Historically, larger bodies have represented wealth, abundance, and even good health. For example, during a plague or drought, the thin body signified the diseased body, or it represented someone who could not afford food. As the Western world became industrialized and urban city life developed, the thin body became more desirable in the modern world as the fat body became a physical representation of our anxieties regarding self-control in a time of abundance and excess. 
There's also a class element to the fear of fat. So while fat people used to signify wealth, today fatness is often used to identify those in lower classes due to the misconception of fat people as being uneducated, of living in a poor neighborhood or food desert, or as unable to purchase organic food and make other good and expensive lifestyle choices. There are other historical factors such as religious influences and beliefs about gluttony, for example, that we could consider. Fat stigma is also the result of racism. Typically, racialized bodies have been believed to be larger than white bodies, and so fat shame is also a result of building and supporting whiteness and white supremacy, where the racialized body is seen as primitive and uncivilized. The image that I have chosen for this slide is of Sarah Bartman, who was used as a living specimen in what was essentially a traveling freak show to represent the racialized, primitive, and fat female body. After her death, her body remained on display until the 1970s, and while this sounds horrific, it is not much different than the display of fat people or their body parts in today's mainstream media. Now, when I did a Google search for an image of Bartman, pictures of her were juxtaposed with pictures of Beyonce and Nicki Minaj, suggesting that these celebrities were the modern day equivalents of Bartman, who was most no known for her large behind. This hypersexual and racialized imagery has been maintained throughout time to perpetuate belief in the biological origins of racialized fatness, and we see it often in the hypersexualization of larger black female celebrities in particular. Currently, concerns about the economy and about the environment act as driving forces in maintaining fat stigma. Some may justify discriminating against fat people because of the belief that fat people use more than their fair share of the healthcare system, or because of the idea that fat people have a bigger impact on the environment. Organizations like PETA use fat shame to advance their cause, insinuating that eating a vegan diet would solve both the problem of animal cruelty in the food industry and the problem of obesity. Today, in a neoliberal environment in which we are encouraged to manage, manage risk and govern ourselves, our anxieties about things like national security and climate change are placed on our bodies. Our physical bodies are a manageable site in which we feel able to contain and destroy anything considered unruly or excessive and need to be ready for us to mobilize in times of crisis or war. While an entire lecture could be dedicated to the historical construction of fat stigma, what I want to show here is that how we categorize bodies according to size is ultimately about control. How we see fatness in a specific context reveals a lot about the political, economic, and social issues of a certain time and place. And I would now like to invite Logan Trudeau to the podium to discuss their experiences navigating the healthcare system and accessing gender-affirming surgery here in BC. Hi there, folks. Uh, as Layla said, my name is Logan Trudeau, uh, and I'm here to talk about the institutional and systemic discrimination that I faced during my gender transition, um, particularly in trying to access top surgery, which for those who are unfamiliar with that term, uh, involves a double mastectomy, nipple grafts, and chest masculinization. Uh, so I'd like to offer uh, just a quick content warning for mention of some childhood trauma and discussion of fatphobic medical gatekeeping. Um, so you've probably noticed that I'm fat, uh, it's important to note that I was also raised and socialized as female, since female folks tend to be the ones who have diet and weight loss rhetoric shoved down their throat from a very young age. Uh, I wasn't always fat, but I was always tall with a large frame, which led to a lot of kids calling me names. Uh, so things like Bigfoot, Jolly Green Giant. Uh, my mom put me in Weight Watchers around the age of 16 after years of policing my food intake and making <laughs> disparaging comments about my size. My brother called me thunder thighs, other awful names. So even though I wasn't technically fat, um, I was sure made to feel like I was and that being fat was a very bad thing. I was a super active kid, uh, suffered from a lot of injuries, particularly due to a misalignment of my legs. I was first diagnosed with osteoarthritis in my feet at the age of 25. And when you add in the layers of internalized fat phobia, gender dysphoria, a trauma filled childhood, and some medications that cause weight gain, Safe to say that my weight was on a slow but steady upward trajectory from about the age of 16. When I first started my transition at the age of 17, or sorry, the age of 37, <laughs> um, I was warned that I would run into systemic fat phobia. Um, in particular, I was warned that I would re be required to lose weight in order to access surgery. Uh, I started hormone therapy in October of 2012, and about six months in, my doctor referred me for top surgery. 
My surgery funding was approved and I was put on a wait list to see the one and only plastic surgeon that MSP was paying to perform those procedures in BC. So my first consult with this doctor was in February of 2015, uh, two and a half years after I started my transition. The appointment did not go well. He immediately jumped into talking about my weight and did not like that I was not willing to discuss weight loss. He refused to hear about the barriers in my life that made weight loss damn near impossible. <laughs> um, he told me that I would not have good results. At the end of our consultation, he said that he would be willing to do my surgery, but that anesthesia would probably turn me away the morning of my surgery due to my weight. I left expecting to wait at least a year for my surgery date to be set, while also not knowing if my surgery would even happen. Neither my partner nor I were very excited about this doctor performing my chest surgery. Uh, so in April of 2015, we decided to make an appointment with a surgeon in Seattle, uh, even with the knowledge that it would cost upwards of $10,000 Canadian. Turned out that this doctor did not have access to a larger hospital, so he wanted me to lose 100 pounds in order to have surgery. He didn't care how I lost it. He didn't care how long I kept it off. Uh, he suggested things like packaged food diets and weight loss surgery, which is ironic, considering that I needed to, lo be, to lose weight to be put under for one surgery, but apparently not the other. Uh, he told me that I could regain the weight after surgery. Uh, dieting and weight cycling are so bad for your health, and here was a medical practitioner suggesting that I do both. So about a year later, there were some new options for surgeons in BC. And so the doctor who was managing my medical transition uh, referred me to a surgeon in Victoria. He turned me away sight unseen, simply based on my weight. I was more than disheartened. I reached out to a friend who works in local trans care uh, who directed me to contact the program director of TransCare BC, which is the organization who manages uh, medical transitions. So I wrote to them and I laid out my story. I demanded the same care that thinner folks were getting and they committed to looking into things and seeing what they could do, but they couldn't promise me anything. Uh, I honestly felt like surgery would never happen, and this was completely detrimental to my mental health. <laughs> Fat bodies can only have surgeries that other people deem necessary. So if I could have a joint fusion in my foot, which I've had, and a complete hysterectomy, why could I not have the life-saving surgery that I wanted, needed? Um, shortly after my correspondence with TransCare, the original local surgeon's office emailed me, the one I had the bad appointment with. They wanted me to come in for a pre-op consult in case they were offered with hospital OR time in the next quarter. Since I hadn't figured out an alternative, I accepted the appointment. The first thing the surgeon said to me when I walked in the room was, well, you haven't lost any weight, so there's nothing I can do for you. He then proceeded to call me uneducated and repeatedly interrupted me as I tried to remind him that I was overall pretty healthy and had compounding factors that made weight loss difficult and that I'd had other surgeries at this size. Adding on to that, his staff had told him that I didn't understand why my surgery couldn't happen at the clinic that the lower BMI surgeries were happening at. I literally had to find the emails with his staff and read them to him to prove to him that I knew that it was because I was fat and that I have some other risk factors and we needed to wait for time at Vancouver General. So when I got emotional and challenged the concept of BMI as a marker of health, he told me that he couldn't work with me if I was gonna make statements like that. His assistant was in tears at this point. I walked out, absolutely vibrating and full of rage. After experiencing verbal abuse and being made to feel less than valid, a week later, this doctor somehow came up with a surgical date to offer me. Since I was just starting a new, a new job, and more importantly, did not trust this man to actually give me a result that I wanted and to not say horrible things about me while I was unconscious, I turned down the date. It was one of the hardest decisions that I have ever made, but I, sorry, I just couldn't stomach working with him or the thought of him working on me. It took another year before TransCare actually started having serious conversations about BMI and access to gender affirming surgery. In March of 2017, I was mysteriously offered a consult with the Victoria surgeon who had turned me down, uh, sight unseen the year before. I had some serious reservations which this surgeon was actually able to ease with a phone call prior to the consult. He had concerns about my size, but understood how important this surgery was to my sense of self and mental health. We agreed to meet and the cons consult went reasonably well. It took another year for him to organize a team for the surgery. When I went for my pre-op consultations with anesthesia, internal medicine and pharmacy, none of them mentioned my weight, not a single one. Looking back, it is more than upsetting that I had to enter those appointments with my fists raised ready to take on the world. 
I was treated horribly by two surgeons and like other fat trans people, I carry this medical trauma with me and it informs how I expect to be treated in all future care. I finally had my surgery in May of this year over four years after the funding was initially approved. And guess what? My surgery went just fine. My results are good, I'm happy. And guess what else? Now I finally feel comfortable to get out and move my body. It's amazing what happens when you take away the fat phobia and you treat the human being. Since my surgery, I've learned, that, I've learned from Transcare BC that the BMI limits have been remo removed from the initial gatekeeping step in order to access gender-affirming surgery. This means that surgeons who perform gender-affirming procedures will be forced to confront their fat phobia and acknowledge the limitations of BMI as a measure of health. While some of the medical practitioners still utilize BMI, change is happening regarding the care of, of fat trans patients. I wanted to have my own surgery, but I also wanted to see systemic change. Uh, fat trans people deserve the same level of care and access to surgery as people who are thin, able-bodied, and cisgendered. We deserve it. That picture again. Oh, Sorry. no, it's okay. <laughs> Just in case you forget who I am. Thank you so much, Logan, for sharing your experiences with us this evening. It made me a little emotional. <laughs> so fatness as obesity. The word obesity is a medicalized term for fatness. And because of the harm that this term has inflicted on fat people, fat scholars and activists often put this word in quotation marks. So I'd appreciate it if every time I use the O word, you imagine these quotation marks around it. Now we prefer the word fat because using it reminds us that it is simply a neutral descriptor, similar to the words like short and tall. And before using the word, and because using the word fat aligns our work with the fat positive movement. The amount of attention that the obesity epidemic receives indicates a dramatic increase in weight statistics when this hasn't actually been the case. The actual percentage of Canada's population that is categorized as overweight has only increased by 10% since 1970, and Canadian obesity rates are even starting to plateau. We are continually warned that being fat will kill you, despite the fact that life expectancy statistics have also gone up. Yes, people are getting fatter, but they are also living longer than ever before in human history. Our fear of fat has such a stronghold in our culture because anyone could theoretically become fat. Fat is anxiety inducing because the causes and cures of fatness remain unclear. We have some guesses as to what may contribute to someone gaining weight, but we do not yet have a viable solution. We continue to advocate that the cure for obesity is simple, just lose weight. We believe weight loss is possible if we embody good behaviors, we simply need to exercise and follow a strict diet regimen. However, 95% of attempts to lose weight fail. Additionally, people who attempt to lose weight are likely to regain not only the weight that they lost, but then some within five years. So suggesting weight loss as a solution to obesity with its 95% failure rate is not a solution at all, and yet it continues to be prescribed to fat people every day. And for the majority who fail to lose weight, this failure adds on to the many other negative presumptions about our bodies and ourselves, impacting our health and creating a vicious cycle. The harm caused by our assumption that fatness is a preventable and curable medical condition includes the following. Fat people are less likely to be accommodated in medical settings due to arbitrary weight restrictions for medical equipment, like Logan so eloquently told us this evening. We are more likely to have surgical instruments left behind inside our bodies than thin people are. Uh, we are also less likely to receive adequate time with doctors. Recently, I learned about a study that concluded that fat women were more likely to die from breast and cervical cancers. However, the fact that fat women are less likely to go to the doctor and therefore less likely to be alerted of a condition before it advances to later stages was not considered. It is quite likely that fat women are more likely to die from these cancers not because they are fat, but because we are afraid of how we will be treated in a medical setting and so we aren't likely to go for routine checkups. 
Last year, I came across a published peer-reviewed journal article that sought to find long-term weight loss solutions for fat people by studying the behaviors of people with anorexia. We live in a world where we encourage fat people to develop eating disorders because it is better to have an eating disorder than it is to be fat. Ironically, fat people are more likely than thin people to already have eating disorders, and so the equation of thinness with disordered eating is also false. Currently, there are BMI restrictions for those who want to adopt a child, and fat people can be re refused in vitro fertilization treatments. To me, this is akin to a eugenics movement, as the only logic behind these restrictions is that fatness is believed to be a biological or environmental risk, concluding that fat parents will automatically result in fat children. The goal of enforcing these restrictions is simple. Refusing fat people the right to reproduce is believed to build a future in which there are no fat people. And I want to add here that in popular culture, visualizations of utopian societies usually do not include a single fat body. As a PhD student, the following statistic was particularly concerning for me. Fat professors receive lower student evaluations, and 93% of human resource professionals have said they would hire a thin person over a fat person with the exact same qualifications. While many of these behaviors are justified under the guise of health concerns, we cannot claim to care about the health of fat people because all of these things that I've listed for you directly impact fat people's physical, mental, and emotional health. Now here's what you don't see in the media. So my undergraduate degrees in journalism and in journalism school, we are taught that there are two types of stories that people will always care about. Stories about money and stories about health. And the moral panic around obesity in particular makes any new development on the topic newsworthy. What you don't see in the media is all of the medical research and fat studies scholarship that counters anti-obesity rhetoric. So the following studies were published in the past few months alone. One, weight loss increases death in overweight or obese patients with diabetes. Weight gain did not increase chance of death. Two, gaining body fat, especially as young adults, may reduce the risk of premenopausal breast cancer. Three, that obese men and women with no other metabolic risk factors are not more likely to die than non-fat people, so basically being fat is not a death sentence. And four, people who have weight loss surgery are more likely to experience fetal growth restriction during pregnancies because of post-surgery eating difficulties, particularly difficulty ingesting iron-rich foods like meat. As an important side note, complications from weight loss surgeries include chronic vomiting, stroke, heart attack, kidney failure, liver failure, vitamin deficiencies, blindness, ulcers, blood clots, and memory loss, among numerous other conditions, and yet this is a rapidly growing industry. We don't see studies like these because they don't support our biases, nor do they support the economic industries that rely on the fear of fat to turn a profit. As previously mentioned, the dieting industry is worth a lot of money, upwards of $66 billion in the US alone. Encouraging people to buy into the idea that weight loss is possible when statistically it is not guarantees repeated customers and keeps the machine going. I think too that admitting that fat people have a right to exist without hating themselves would force us to rethink some of our own harmful behaviors that we impose upon ourselves. Why would we dedicate so much of our lives to the goal of having a thinner body if it didn't actually make us better than anyone else? I'd now like to invite Athena Afan to the podium to share her story and perform a poem for us tonight. Thanks. Just making sure this thing works. <clears throat> okay, um, first I wanna say congratulations, Leila, and thank you so much for having me here to speak tonight. It is a pleasure and an honor. Um, Hello, everybody. I'm gonna chat at you for a little bit, then I will provide the too long didn't read version, too long didn't read TMI version in the form of a poem. Um, so after I finish doing my talky bit, I'll come over here and do my poemy bit, and then you can shower me with your adoration and applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to add a content note that um, in my talk and in my poem, uh, there's discussion of weight loss and also talk of death. So my story, like my friend's story, begins with a doctor's appointment. For many fat folks, the medical system is where we experience the most healthism, sizeism, and fat hatred. Sorry, I forgot my slides, so I'm just gonna put it up there. <laughs> Make it go. There we go. 
don't know if you can read it, but that's good. Um, now, don't get me wrong. Some health professionals see beyond the size of my body and engage with me as the whole, thoughtful, intelligent person that I am, but this is not the norm. Actually, the fact that some practitioners can treat me without making the ubiquitous fat diagnosis kind of makes me think that the negative experiences are a result of practitioner bias or worse, willful ignorance. Anyway, the doctor I was seeing was supposed to assess my case and then recommend me for a sleep study. Things went from bad to worse when I told him I weight, something that I don't always do, because he started in with the usual, you should lose weight lecture. Understand that while I do believe that I can make lifestyle changes that might improve some aspects of my health, weight loss goals are not an option. I tried explaining that a few different ways, but got nowhere. Just to see what he would say, I said to him, so in your medical opinion, how do you lose weight and keep it off? His response was that I should eat less and get some exercise. Oh, and that I don't have to worry about fat anymore. Fat is okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> For those of you who haven't heard this firsthand, fat people are very aware that people think that we should lose weight. The information that our bodies are wrong is everywhere. So is it any surprise that some of us have tried it? In fact, many of us, not all, have spent large portions of our lives dedicated to dieting, exercising, and becoming experts at counting calories, and carbs, and sugar, and fat. Over the course of my life, I've been on more diets than I can recall, and I have lost hundreds of pounds. This is not an exaggeration. I counted one time when creating positive affirmations for weight loss attempt number 23. Furthermore, as Layla said, research indicates that 95% of people who engage in weight loss attempts have regained weight within two to five years. So when medical professionals suggest weight loss and oversimplified weight loss strategies as though I've never considered it or without knowing my lifestyle, then that isn't medical concern. It is intrusive, shaming, and insulting. Oh, geez, slides. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I think about it. Anyways, back to the moment with the doctor. My face got hot. I began, oh, sorry, I'm off by. Back to the moment with the doctor. My face got hot. I began to tremble. I had a vivid fantasy of standing up and saying something like, you'll have to excuse me, doctor, but I'll have to end the appointment right here. You see, I don't believe we can work together. Thank you for your time. I didn't say that. In the fog of feeling, I just said to myself over and over, just get the referral, you don't have to come back. Just get the referral, you don't have to come back. When I finally found my way back to my car, one thought was clear and present in my mind. Why, I thought, why do I have to trade my dignity for healthcare? Once I started thinking about it, I realized that dignity is the everyday price I pay to exist as a fat person in a sizest, healthest, and fat-hating world. This is not the only problem or the worst problem that fat people face, but it is a persistent and endless problem. In some ways, it's like I have an, an ongoing invoice that just keeps growing, a bill that will never be paid in full. Take this, for example. Let me see what I got here. Sorry about my slides. <laughs> a couple of weekends ago, I went to a play at a local theater. I've been to this theater a number of times and hadn't had any problems. Well, besides the typical discomfort I face because most theater seats aren't built for my body. But this time, when I made my way to my assigned seat, I found myself facing a tiny space between a pillar and a railing that I needed to squeeze through to get to my spot. So I took a deep breath, gathered some momentum, and started to force my body through the gap while trying to look like this is what everyone was doing. When my friend said to me, don't do that, those seats aren't accessible. As I let her lead me to another spot, I still found myself sussing out another opening that I could potentially crawl through to get to the spots. Squeezing and forcing my body places is an everyday occurrence, in and out of my car, into chairs and tables at restaurants, past tables at school, theater seats, past people in public spaces, in my home, on transit, in the toilet, and that's only if I really have to go because sometimes peeing is just not worth it. What saddens me about this is that I didn't invite my fat friends to this show because I knew that those seats would not accommodate some of them at all. And there was an amazing, brilliant fat actor in that show too. I cannot imagine that crawling, squeezing, and selecting friends by size is a typical Friday night for most people like it is for me. 
Add that to the bill. Item, Friday night out. Cost, sizeism, and dignity. But this has been happening my whole life. Let me go back a little further. When I was young, I started menstruating earlier than expected. I was also one of the tallest girls in my class. My mother was a little concerned about my rapid development, so she took me to the doctor who referred me to BC Children's. I vaguely remember doing a bunch of different tests that ended up being inconclusive. I clearly remember coming home with my first diet. I can still picture the little diet book itself, a small three ring binder filled with tiny words and colorful pages of meals and measurements, as compact and tidy as it promised that I would become. There were so many things in that book that were completely different from my regular diet. Cottage cheese, canned fruit, no seasonings. The thing is, my family is from Trinidad. The foods I ate at home every day were delicious stews and curries served on rice, all prepared from scratch. No wonder I was given responsibility of that book. My parents didn't have a clue what to do with it. It has taken me a while to realize it, but those colorful pages reduced me, all right. Not only did they inform me that my body was wrong, but they also told me that the food I ate, my cultural foods, my culture itself was wrong. I was 10 years old. Item, a mother's concern for her child. Cost, sizeism, racism, and dignity. This bill has many items on it and it continues to grow daily because dignity is the price that I pay as a fat person in a sizest, healthest, and fat-hating world. I can't help but wonder what the long-term effects of lost dignity has been on my body, mind, and spirit, on my health, on my heart. Yet, to exist as a fat person in this world, I have to trade it to access basics that others enjoy for free. I want to encourage you to imagine how we as individuals, allies, and communities of concern can move beyond basic acceptance and tolerance of all bodies to a place of uncompromising inclusion and utmost regard. Would spaces we enjoy suddenly become uncomfortable once we truly commit to accessibility for all bodies? Would we interrogate our relationships, our desires? What might happen if all of us became highly invested in a world that evoked dignity rather than a world that demands that some people relinquish it just to live in it. When I think of the work of scholars like Leila, fat activists, and folks like myself and my friend Logan, for whom this work is what we must do to survive, I believe that this world can exist someday. And I hope that something you hear this evening makes you willing to believe in it and fight for it too. Zach, am I on? This body is your worst nightmare. This body is not worth clothes that fit or a chair to sit in that won't break beneath the gravity of this situation. This body takes lives. It is both symptom and disease. It will kill me someday, the doctors say, as though their bodies were somehow immune to the entropy of nature and time. And some children, adults, youth, rest in peace die of restriction, overexertion, poison, and starvation out of fear of this body. This body must not bear children because any seed planted in the crucible of this body will twist and rot on the vine or worst case scenario, be born in the perfect image. And if that should happen, they might take those children away because this body cannot be trusted, obviously. Speaking of sex, this body is not desirable, unless you desire to laugh at fat tits and a fat ass or the fetish of being smothered under pounds of flesh. What am I saying? This body probably hasn't even had sex. This body is black, and even though slavery is over, everyone knows that this body, this color, and this gender continues to serve forced labor physical, and emotional. This body is angry, but this body is invisible. This body is a threat, the recommendation war, and then amputation with the intention of complete and utter extinction, because this body must be stopped at all costs.
but I won't stop because this body is desirable and this body desires any gender under the sun or none. And this body loves more than one. And this body has birthed two beautiful children, love and courage, who hold the power to transform this world into a place where this body is respected, where all bodies are respected, revered, and held as sacred. Yeah, I'm carrying some weight, the weight of past, present, and future. But this body, your worst nightmare, could hold the key to all of our wildest dreams. feeling kind of sad and overwhelmed that I didn't save both Logan and Athena for the end because it's hard acts to follow. And it's that picture again. <laughs> okay, so over half of this presentation has been dedicated to discussing the medicalization of fatness and the significant real life consequences of fat stigma. Now it's important to do this because more often than not, people will not listen to you until you challenge these beliefs. But I want to take a moment now to address the elements of healthism in this conversation. Yes, we have just spent a very significant amount of time emphasizing that being fat is not always unhealthy. But distancing ourselves as fat people from conceptions of unhealthy bodies does not offer liberation or respect for people living with chronic illness or disability, fat, thin, or otherwise. I think this debate about health needs to go deeper. Why do we want bodies to be healthy? What does this have to do with our ideas around productivity? What do we view as an achievement and why? How does our fear of fat relate to our fear of death and dying? What do diets say about our irrational desire to achieve immortality? While it's important to recognize that fat bodies can also be active or fit or healthy, it is important that we not rest our dignity and humanity or our access to basic human rights on this idea because then we alienate fat people and others who may not be any of these things. And now we get to talk about my favorite, reality TV. Um, as I said, I love reality TV, but it's also ripe with content about fat stigma. So fat people on traditional reality TV. There are three subgenres of reality TV that have particular uses for fat bodies, the competition, the makeover, and the voyeuristic documentary, or what I am calling here the sick and dead. In the competitive reality show, fat people are used to signify the before picture or the individual who is in desperate need of transformation. In a competitive setting, fat people are often pitted against each other to see who can achieve the most drastic transformation. The Biggest Loser is perhaps the most successful example, although the show has recently been taken off the air when past contestants claim to have been abused while filming the show. While acknowledging that the name of the show is meant to insinuate that fat people are losers who also need to lose a massive amount of weight, the biggest loss is often paid by the contestants themselves. While some may win money or 15 minutes of fame, the lifelong impact of short-term drastic weight loss is only just beginning to be revealed as more and more cast members go public with not only their inability to keep off the weight, but also the health problems they have experienced since being on the show. What competitive and transformative reality shows insinuate to the audience, however, is that weight loss, something that we are all supposed to want, is possible if you push yourself hard enough. The makeover genre of reality television is an especially important governing tool as these shows carefully instruct audiences how to improve themselves, not only for their own good, but also for the betterment of their communities and of the nation. Not only our bodies, but also our homes, our neighborhoods, careers, and cars serve as sites of transformation within this subgenre in order to dictate to audiences what constitutes a desirable and valued way of life. This example on the slide is particularly heartbreaking to me. Pictured here is Mama June, the matriarch of the household in the hit TLC show, Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. I wrote my master's thesis on this show, arguing that it was one of the first truly feminist reality TV shows, which you can ask me about that later if you would like. Now the picture on the left is from when Here Comes Honey Boo Boo was on the air. 
throughout this show, Mama June often proclaimed that she loved herself and she loved her body. She was my hero as she advocated that everyone should love their body and as she shone light on food poverty, class issues, and racialized stereotypes in the American South, whether she knew it or not. Recently, Mama June received her own spin-off show, the show focuses on how she rapidly earned a revenge body through surgeries and other interventions just in time to crash her ex-husband's wedding. Needless to say, I will not be publishing my master's thesis anytime soon, but it goes to show that even the most radical, confident, and self-loving people are vulnerable to the exploits of the television industry and to the pressures placed on fat people. When fat people are not be being made over or pitted against one another in competition, then they are used in reality TV as extreme warning signs to the general public. The image here is from the BBC show Obesity Postmortem, in which the dead body of a fat American woman was dissected to visualize for the audience fatness as a life-threatening condition. Not only are these types of shows incredibly violent and traumatizing, they also completely decontextualize and dehumanize the subject. My 600 pound life is another example of a show that projects fat people as sick and dying. On this show, a camera crew follows people who are 600 pounds or more as they seek weight loss surgery at a clinic in Texas. By focusing only on these individuals, my 600 pound life inevitably infers to the audience that situations like these happen more often than they actually do. And while the use of talking head interviews and therapeutic interventions acknowledge contributing factors such as systemic oppression, trauma, and abuse, the solutions pushed by these shows remain the same. It is up to the individual to lose weight by any means necessary or else they will die. Now the reality television industry has only recently begun to embrace body positivity. However, fat people are not quite off the hook in this subgenre, as fatness is coupled with either good health, impressive levels of fitness, or some kind of explanation that rids the person of responsibility for their size. One of, the bi or one of the strongest examples of body positive reality TV is TLC's My Big Fat Fabulous Life. Whitney Waythor, the star of the show who's pictured here, is a dancer with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Her career as a dancer, paired with her illness, excuses her fatness because she is both fat and active and fat and sick. Her happy and confident demeanor somewhat relieves Whitney of responsibility for her size, and she is a relatable and comforting figure for the audience. However, throughout the show, her parents and other medical experts, along with concerns from her friends, continue to remind Whitney that weight loss and other lifestyle changes would help her in the long run, and so she is never truly free to be happy with her body as it is. The main difference between body positivity and fat positivity is that body positivity is essentially a watered down version and it doesn't actually do anything to advance the status of fat people. Body positivity erases systemic and institutional forms of oppression that fat people face. It encourages self-love through consuming and achieving normative beauty standards and it often still upholds health as a necessary factor for self-love and acceptance. We're seeing more and more bigger bodies in the media, which is a step in the right direction, but increasing the number of fat people on TV is not always synonymous with meaningful representation. We need to see fat characters with real storylines and complex story development. So this is where my activist and my artistic work comes in. Fat Hiking Club is my first completed short documentary film. As mentioned in the introduction, the film captures the story of Summer Misho Skog, the founder of Fat Girls Hiking, which is an organization based in Portland. Summer's mission is to make the outdoors accessible for everybody and everybody. The film follows her as her organization quickly grows in popularity, which inspires her to host pop-up hikes in other places, her first stop being Vancouver. My time making Fat Hiking Club taught me many things. First and foremost, that it is very ambitious and quite possibly irresponsible to think that you can make a documentary film while pursuing your PhD. <laughs> I don't think I will make another one before I'm finished. And second, it takes more time and money than you can ever prepare for. Third, that not all feminists are sympathetic to or even familiar with the fat positive movement. Now, during the crowdfunding stage of production, I posted about the film in a Facebook group for women-identified feminists who work in media in Vancouver. I was asking whether I should use Indiegogo or Kickstarter as a funding platform. 
Now, instead of answering my question, I was criticized for using the word fat in the title of my film and accused of making a film shaming women about their bodies. Now, I was shocked that anyone thought that I would make such a film as a dedicated member of Vancouver's feminist media making community. So I decided to leave the group after my post was removed and my question remained unanswered. And for anyone who cares, I went with Indiegogo. <laughs> I don't think it really mattered at the end of the day, but that's beside the point. Even at recent events like the Women's March, there were protesters carrying tongue-in-cheek posters that read, does this sign make my ass look fat? Now, Donald Trump, for all of the evil things we could hold against him, is often shamed for his body before his politics by people who are more likely to be open to the fat justice movement. And it is so disheartening and exhausting to realize that even the social justice warriors of the world hate fat people. Fourth, I learned that your roles as both a filmmaker and an activist will often come into conflict with one another. It was difficult to satisfy both the aesthetic and practical demands of filmmaking and the aims of fat activism. For example, visualizing a climb up a mountain in a short amount of time often involves things like bottom up shots or close ups of sweat dripping down someone's face or sounds of heavy breathing, which are all tactics used by the mainstream media to depict the abject nature of fatness. Some of the other things I had to consider while making the film include, am I contributing to the idea that fat bodies are okay only if they are physically active? Are the hikes that we filmed accessible to people with disabilities? Am I watering down the complex feelings of hiking while fat by filming someone overcoming their fat oppression by both literally and figuratively climbing a mountain? <laughs> And during the pre-production phase, I was approached by a potential corporate sponsor, and this company was a travel company. So I had to ask myself, what does sponsorship from a travel company mean for this film? Does this travel company work with any businesses such as airlines that discriminate against fat people? In the end, I know that Fat Hiking Club is not a perfect, ex perfect example of fat activist media, but it is a start, and I believe that it provides an entry point for important conversations around fatness and outdoor activities. And I'd like to show a clip of the film, which I should be able to make full screen. The hike today was awesome. We had uh, about 10 people show up. Some folks from Seattle came all the way up to Vancouver, BC. Uh, they left at like three in the morning to come and hike with us because they don't have any, um, any people to hike with in their area. Um, and getting to the top together is really great. Um, it doesn't always happen, but I love it when it does. And all of us standing up on the rock together was really beautiful and empowering. I have a lot of dreams for fat girls hiking. Um, my biggest dream right now is to get an RV and travel around the US, or North America really, Canada and Mexico, and um, help people in different areas build communities where, that they can be a part of um, to bring people together hiking and doing things outdoors. And I hope to do that. I, I'm working on it. We'll see what happens. Um, I also want to travel internationally and do the same thing. Um, lead group hikes in those areas and help people figure out how to do that um, for themselves as well. Um, I also want to just give you an update on Summer from the film. As of last month, she's now touring North America and setting up Fat Girls Hiking chapters all over the East Coast of America and Canada. And I'm very, very proud of her and very excited to see what happens next for her and for the organization. I'm also obsessed with the drone shots in our film, which is partly why I chose that clip. And so I also want to acknowledge Danny Easton of East to West Productions, who worked really hard on Fat Hiking Club and made it happen. Now, I want to end this presentation with a slogan that came from an outdoor recreational camp for fat folks called Wild Abundance Expeditions. I attended their camp in Washington State two years ago. At the beginning of the retreat, our group collectively came together to determine a set of community values and rules that would shape our weekend together. One of the things that we came up with was that there would be no fatty left behind. You might have seen it on the back of my t-shirt in the clip that I just showed you. 
What this slogan means is that regardless of someone's health status, ability level, personal interests, size, or dietary preferences, every person in our group would be respected and would be included in any of the activities we were going to be partaking in. If someone wanted to participate in an activity like the high ropes course or sea kayaking, then we would figure out a way to make that possible. It has become a mantra that I follow in my academic, activist, and other professional work. In future conversations you might have about this presentation or about body positivity or even about reality television, I hope that you will also strive to leave no fatty left behind. Thank you all very much for being here and thank you again to Logan and Athena for your presentations. And I believe we've got about 20 minutes for a Q&A and then I hope to see you at the reception afterwards. Thank you very much. So th there's a microphone in front of you. Push the oh, red great. button there, and then we can all hear you. Oh, yeah. that's so fancy. OK, cool. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was really powerful and super emotional. And I'm just overwhelmed. Like, you guys are doing such important work. And thank you. Thank you so deeply. My question is, as also a fellow PhD student and person who strives to make the world a little bit more accessible in ways. I think one of the most important things that I learned from you, I think it was like a year ago, was just chairs with arms and how annoying and problematic they are. And when I asked people for chairs without arms, how impossible they are to find. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on sort of things that we can do, whether we're teachers or people in the world that are really easy, like just making sure there's a chair without arms in the room. Uh, because that was really a powerful moment for me. And I continue to try to think of things, but I'm so much less brilliant than you. So I just love to hear if you have any, you know, hot tips for those of us who don't really know how to do this, but want to. Oh, it's on. Um, the only thing I can think of uh, I mean, it's, it's about accessibility in general, right? It's not just about fat people. It's about everybody. Um, we all have different accessibility needs. I remember um, when I was doing my coursework, I read a book on fat activism and in the different kinds of fat activism. And the author named Charlotte Cooper suggested that you could be an activist within your own home and you could just make your home fat friendly. So making sure that you know your doorways, your bathroom, your couch is accessible. And I remember I was sitting in my living room reading this book and I was so uncomfortable because it had never occurred to me that I could be comfortable in my own home. I think it's so ingrained in us that we just should accept what we get or what's easy. And for something that's so simple and so straightforward and that a lot of people take for granted, I was disgusted with myself that I had allowed myself to live in an uncomfortable space. Um, I mean, I think too, it's important to just ask people, ask people what they need. When you host events and you have an RSVP link, put a little box that says, how can we best accommodate your body? Um, because there are, like you said, there's always gonna be things that we can't think of or we can't predict, but that we should be prepared for. Um, other than that, like, I don't know, burn down chair factories that don't make chairs without arms. I have no idea how to like get the message across because you're right, it's next to impossible. Other, like I find too, if you ask for chairs without arms, you get like folding chairs, which like as a fat person, my worst nightmare is to sit down on something and have it collapse. And it's happened. And you are expected to just laugh it off when it's probably, it's just like public humiliation. So I don't know, you heard it here first, burn it down. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I, I really appreciate your, your presentation of the diversity of people in terms and also challenging the health uh, uh, messages we get about, about being fat and so on. I, I see a lot of people, a lot of theater and films now are portraying f in a positive way, like uh, I've seen some shows in the festivals and so on. I, 
and I, I'm glad that they are coming out in open, but I work with seniors, elders, and their challenge is to be wrinkle-free. Now, if you lose fat, then you get the wrinkles. And the challenge is now, uh, I think there are communities which are fighting to be wrinkle-free, and there are communities who are trying to be fat-free. And it seems like we are in a very contradictory society. My question is, uh, how do we balance these messages? Because uh, I think that uh, that it's a trap. And I wonder if, if there is a gender difference in terms of how men are accepted to be of certain uh, shape and face compared to women. I don't know whether you got my question or especially in the media. <laughs> um, maybe I'll start and maybe Layla will finish. But I think that there's, um, and Layla spoke to it a little bit, an obsession with um, kind of like immortality and health. Like I think that our society almost fetishizes those things. And I think that upon further and closer examination, they are at odds with each other. Because of course we cannot obtain immortality, it's impossible. And also the idea of um, perfect health, I think that if we think about all the kinds of things as humans with um, really temporal bodies, that the idea of perfect health is also kind of a construction in a way. Um, and if we allow ourselves to entertain this idea that there is perfect health, then a whole lot of people and bodies and get left out. Like you said, it's, it's an intersectional approach to how we look at bodies. So ageism and sizeism, classism, racism, ableism, all of these things come together to ostracize and further marginalize communities or groups of people. In terms of representation in the media, I think that it has always been the case for marginalized populations that when, where we are more likely to see ourselves is in things like queer film festivals or alternative media, you know, in the hidden places and corners online or within our own communities that we create to survive. I think still that what we see in mainstream media isn't radical enough, it's not complex enough. You know, shows like This Is Us, which are so successful and have fat characters, the fat character still has the same storyline. The male fat character wears a, a fat suit in order to like visualize fatness. So I think that what we need to do is open up mainstream media and mainstream conversations to the conversations that marginalized communities have been having for decades in and amongst themselves, because at this point, it's not us who need to see these representations, it's everybody else. Um, I just have something to say, which is, um, I thought your um, presentation's fabulous, and I really enjoyed the, uh, the, uh, present, uh, the uh, part presentations also from your two um, um, uh, respondents there. Um, I think one of the things that our society is facing is is the um, influence of fashion, and um, I see it in my um, my younger relatives, nie nieces and nephews, and uh, and uh, the peer pressure also. And I'm always delighted when I see um, models featured on TV um, in a fashion, uh, sports, illustrated, whatever, um, to show to include uh, more types of people to, to, sh to show young people that it's it's not all about being having the super tall uh, skinny the, the the model figure but it's um, that everybody um, has their own certain um, spark and and the inclusivity is important in society um, and I, I feel terrible when I hear about pre-teenagers engaging in smoking and doing this these sort of things to uh, become thin because thin is in and all this sort of thing so that society does have to make um, the importance of um, things like being aware of, of um, being overweight and advocating for for people um, and I think what you're doing is is very good thank you 
do think that it's inspiring to see um, what they would call plus size models in the industry. Um, that's actually kind of where I got my start in fat activism. But I do think that what we see in the plus size world is still white people, people who have curves in the right places, people who are fat in the right ways, you know, a big chest, a big, big hips, you know, no double chin, that kind of thing. Um, and I think for a lot of fat folks, it's almost like too little too late. Of course, we want to be able to buy clothing in our size. And I've always found it really ironic that we were, especially I was never able to find workout clothing because all you're told to do is work out, but then you can't actually find clothing in which you could do that. So, it, you know, are you supposed to wear a garbage bag to the gym? I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, being enveloped into capitalist industries, like it's great that they're realizing that we also have money that we're willing to spend, but it's still not enough. You know, until like there's one company called Universal Standard that actually has really incredible and radically diverse models. But even within the plus size industry, we're still going to make young people feel bad about themselves if they deviate at all now from this idealized image of what a fat person should look like. Oh, it worked. Okay. Um, thank you to all three of you, um, first of all, for this presentation. I really appreciate the complexities and the nuance that you brought from all three of your perspectives. Um, Layla, I just wanted to ask, I'm also a PhD student and have experienced the tensions within academia doing controversial work. Um, and I know that you have experienced some backlash from community groups um, and the public, so to speak. But can you speak to any of that uh, taking place within academia itself? Yes. <laughs> um, in part, I wonder if I was eligible for this award because of a lecture I gave in the communications department. It was a third year lecture on, I believe, sports and technology and society. And afterwards, um, students took it upon themselves to post in an online forum about about uh, about the lecture. They said it was the worst lecture in the School of Communications they'd ever seen, which personally I consider an achievement because there are a lot of lectures that happen every day. Um, but you know, they also commented things like, you ate your way in, you can walk your way out. Um, this is what happens when we prioritize feelings in academia instead of facts. And I think the backlash that I tend to get from at least students is always directed to my body and never what I have to say. And I think that's because we feel a lot of anxiety when someone threatens or confronts ideas that we have about a valuable body. The amount of time that we spend working out or dieting, it's, it's harmful and we don't always want to do it. A lot of the conversations we have about working out are about how it's such a pain. Um, and I think, that, I think that a lot of people feel threatened by that. I was at Congress actually this past summer at a panel on critical dietetics, so fat positive people in public health, and the chairs weren't accessible to fat people. And I was trying to squeeze myself into this chair while also just furious that I wanted to attend this discussion and it didn't even occur, you know, to the institution that there might be bodies, you know, slightly bigger than mine. And like I said at the beginning of the, of the presentation, I'm a small fat person. Even when I was announced as the winner of this award, SFU did a great job at marketing this. And I forgot LinkedIn was a thing, but on LinkedIn, there was an article post or like an announcement. And a, a student at SFU commented, you know, I disagree with this. I think that shaming fat people, if it means that they will exercise and work on themselves is a good thing. Um, and something like if we allow people to be happy about themselves, then they're not going to take care of themselves or be in good health or whatever. And it's so ironic to me that, you know, we still think that shaming people is ultimately a good tactic to, you know, enhance their health status. So ultimately, I just think that, you know, we don't live in a black hole as academics. And even though I think a lot of us do maybe lean more towards the radical left or just have these like radical ideas, it's so challenging as a fat academic to actually go out there and present your work and try to have a critical conversation. We had to dedicate 40 minutes tonight to talking about public health um, because you have to, otherwise people won't listen. So I hate to tell you that it's bleak, but it's, <laughs> It's pretty bleak <laughs> in academia and elsewhere. Any other questions? I got the five-minute warning. 
since we're busy patting ourselves on the back for giving you an award, uh, what would you change about SFU if there was one thing to make our campuses more welcoming, accessible places? I mean, you already gave me the award, so I guess, <laughs> like, really, how about her? But also, like, I may want to work for you one day, so I need to be careful. Um, I mean, only one thing? Ugh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, everything on the Burnaby campus is, like, uphill for some reason. I have no idea. Um, I, oh, God, I don't know. Um, probably the seats in the classroom, to be honest. I think that a lot of universities, in response to trying to be more accessible, they've placed a table at the back of the room that has a, a chair that you can pull in and out. And what that kind of does is it just shines a light on you when you go and sit there that you are different and you need special accommodations. Um, I, I mean, especially, can we just get rid of the chairs where the desk is attached too? Because that works for no one, even a child. It's just impossible to put it down. So if we were gonna start anywhere, it would be with the structures within our own classrooms because that sends such a significant message to who is welcome and who is not. And I can't tell you the amount of times that I have been distracted during a lecture because I've either felt humiliated or I have felt uncomfortable in my seat. I know that would cost a lot of money though, but <laughs> it would be a good place to start. <laughs> I'll think on it though and get back to you. I think we actually have to wrap up the Q&A, but again, thank you everyone for attending this evening. Um, and thank you. So, just, just before we go, I'd just like to say a few words in closing. First of all, I note that downstairs, while we were speaking up here, there's a lecture on female deities in Greek culture. Apparently they are unaware that Athena and the other deities are up here, so. Well, <laughs> Um, and I'd also like you to reflect for a moment on the words from the terms of reference at the beginning and ask if this didn't happen to you this evening. Um, the work should prevent new, present new ways of looking at the world, be daring and creative, decidedly unconventional and distinctly untraditional. So you guys have really done that this evening. So thank you very much to all three of you. I'd like to thank the audience for attending. I'd like to thank the Sterling family for their uh, vision and generosity in establishing uh, this prize. SFU Public Square for uh, organizing this evening. I remind you there's a reception outside following. Uh, please take a few minutes to attend. You can speak to Layla and Athena and uh, Logan. Uh, and if you uh, are thinking about a nomination in the upcoming round, please come and talk to me or another member of the committee. And uh, good night, everybody, and uh, thanks for attending. Thank you very much.